Okay, ready to go. Okay. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We're going to uh, let participants start to join here. So we're gonna give just a few seconds to let all of you come on and, and join our study talk session and we'll get started. Humanity is on a quest. It's a quest that began thousands of years ago when our ancestors first gazed upon the starry sky and wondered, are we alone? We still wanna know, is our world unique and harboring life among the billions of similar worlds in our own galaxy? Or has life sprung up elsewhere and had the chance to evolve to the development of complex organisms, perhaps including intelligent creatures or even advanced technological civilizations? It's a question that has captured the imagination of many from Galileo to Einstein Winston Churchill to Carl Sagan, Jill Tarter to Avi Loeb. It seems even the Pope wants to know. And here's our own brother Guy, Consul Magno, who is on um, the Science Advisory Board here at the SETI Institute and happens to also be the Vatican astronomer, shown here with Pope, Fra uh, Pope Francis. Indeed, even NASA wants to know. In fact, the top three science questions at the US Space Agency are number one, how does the universe work? Number two, how did we get here? And number three, are we alone? What sets us apart from those who've wondered before and makes this particular moment in history so important uh, is that for the first time, we actually have the tools and technology to find out. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to a very special edition of our SETI Talks monthly lecture series produced by the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. I'm Bill Diamond, President and CEO. The SETI Institute is a nonprofit research and education institution whose mission is to lead humanity's quest to understand the origins and prevalence of life and intelligence in the universe. Like most of you, we're presently carrying on our work from home, but our research, education, and outreach programs continue unabated. SETI Talks has been running for more than 10 years, and if you explore the series on our YouTube channel, you'll discover hundreds of lectures, debates, and panel discussions featuring many of the world's foremost researchers, educators, and explorers in space science, covering an extraordinary range of topics. Normally we deliver this to a live audience in the San Francisco Bay Area. The, uh, the series has been virtual since April, but this is giving us the opportunity to reach a truly global audience and share our stories and our science with people the world over. I will say that the SETI Talks program is a program of our philanthropic outreach, if you will, our gift to, uh, to all of you and to the public, sharing the work we do uh, and sharing our stories with all of you. It is given to you at no cost to the Institute, but of course there is a cost to us to put it together. And therefore we are very appreciative of those who wanna support programs like SETI Talks and the other various ways we have of doing public engagement and outreach. So do keep that in mind and keep us in your thoughts as you think about ways to support uh, the kinds of organizations you'd like to support with your philanthropy. We delight in bringing fascinating topics and amazing guests to our study talk series, including many of our own scientists, but we don't often talk about the Institute as a whole. We realize that many of you don't really know us. So today we're gonna to change all that and give you the opportunity to go behind the scenes, and look under the hood and meet some of the leadership team here at the Institute. We'll talk about the full breadth of our science and research and discuss how we leverage curiosity and the fascination with space for compelling and impactful education programs. I'd like to welcome all of our guests joining us live today on our Zoom channel and also say hello to our friends and followers joining us on Facebook and YouTube. We always love to know where you're joining us from. So if you're on Zoom, use the chat function to let us know. Or if you're on Facebook, you can use the comment section. But it's great fun to find out how far and wide these talks are reaching. If you're a regular attendee at these talks, you'll know that we like to poll the audience to find out who's joining us for the first time. But tonight we're gonna to do something a bit different and we'll ask you two separate questions a little bit later on. First is a poll to find out how many of you think there's life beyond earth. And second, how many believe there's intelligent life beyond earth? And just for fun, we're gonna do this at both the beginning and the end of the discussion and compare the results. So when you see the poll, qu uh, poll question pop up in a little, in a little bit uh, on your Zoom platform, this won't show up on the other platforms, click your answer and hit the submit button. 
Now, before we get to the poll questions, let me introduce tonight's panelists. They are, first of all, Dr. Natalie Cabral, who is the director of the Carl Sagan Center for Research at the Institute. Natalie is a planetary geologist and astrobiologist. Dr. Andrew Simeon, the Bernard M. Oliver Chair of SETI Research at the Institute, and also a radio astronomer at University of California, Berkeley, and head of the Breakthrough Listen SETI Initiative. Pamela Harmon, Director of Education and Principal Investigator for our Reaching for the Stars, NASA Science for Girl Scouts STEM program. Pamela is an educator with extensive experience in the development and execution of wide-ranging STEM programs for all ages. And finally, Dr. Simon Steele, our Director of Education, Outreach, and Communications. Simon is an astrophysicist and university lecturer with teaching credentials that include Harvard University, Tufts University, and most recently, University College London. So today my colleagues and I will take you on a journey of discovery to meet the SETI Institute and learn more about the work we do, how we do it, where we do it, but hopefully we don't have to go into why we do it. We'll have time for audience questions after the moderated discussion. Note that we are not able to answer all your questions. Also be aware that you won't necessarily see all the questions in your own chat, but we do see them all. Uh, so you wanna use that chat function at the bottom of the Zoom uh, screen to ask your question, uh, sorry, you, you wanna use the Q&A function to uh, ask your questions. Use the chat function to tell us where you are. Use the, the Q&A button to ask your questions. Um, our colleague, Rebecca McDonald, will be fielding your questions on Zoom and uh, you'll, you'll uh, be able to get them addressed, hopefully. We won't necessarily have time for all of them, but we do our best to address the most interesting ones, so be creative. So let's get started with our poll and put up our two questions. And then I'll follow with some introductory comments to set the stage for our discussion. And we'll share the answers before moving to the panelists. So let's buckle up and get started. Here's the first question. How many of you believe there is life beyond Earth? So you want to hit your yes or no or not sure, and then hit submit. And we'll give uh, just a few seconds here for you all to do that. Okay, so hopefully you've all been quick enough to make up your mind and click the button of your choice. And now let's go to the second question, if we can. We're gonna ask you to uh, opine on the notion of whether or not there's intelligent life beyond Earth. So the first question was, is there life of any kind from microbial uh, objects uh, that would live in a Petri dish? Or uh, this question now is really about intelligent life beyond Earth. Yes, no, or not sure. So hit the submit button. All right, so in just a few minutes before we uh, move to the panelists, we'll, we'll show you the results. Let me first uh, give a bit of um, context about the Institute itself. I'd like to share with you some information about who we are and what we do and how we're organized. So let me first say something um, about the team here at the Institute uh, that constitutes the, the program. Let me just get control of my Zoom screen, which is not functioning at the moment. Okay, so, um, all right, so here we are. The SETI Institute is home to more than 100 PhD scientists plus 34 education, communication, and professional administrative staff. We are a 501c3 nonprofit research institute, and we're funded by federal research grants and contracts. We're funded by private foundations, corporate uh, partners, and also private individuals who care about our work. We are a top 100 NASA contractor, and we collaborate with academic and research institute partners around the world. And first and foremost, I think it's fair to say that all of us are pioneers and explorers standing on the shoulders of giants and embracing humanity's quest with excitement, optimism, and rigorous science. The mission of the SETI Institute, again, is to lead humanity's quest to understand the origins and prevalence of life and intelligence in the universe. And we organize our activities around three prim primary centers. First, the Carl Sagan Center for Research to explore, the Center for Education to inspire, and the Center of Outreach to engage. So with that, let's pop the answers up to the poll questions real briefly and see how we did I'm going to stop the screen share here, and then we'll move over to our panelists. So Lee, do we have uh, some results from the poll? Ah, so 95% so of you believe there is life beyond Earth. So we're, we're 
clearly dealing with the converted already here, so it doesn't look like we have too much of a hard sell to convince you. 4% are not sure. 1%, interesting, says, no, don't think so. All right, we'll see if uh, we can change that individual's mind or those small group here. And uh, what did we get for intelligent likely? Okay, 81% gets a little more interesting, 17% not sure. So again, a lot of you feel, I guess, as we do, that uh, there's probably intelligent life out there when you start looking at the statistical analysis and the probabilities. 3% uh, of you say no, and 17% say not sure. All right, so we'll do this again at the end. And uh, in the meantime, we'll see if our panelists and Institute uh, leadership team can convince you uh, otherwise, uh, for those of you still in doubt. So we're gonna start with Natalie Cabral, the director of the Carl Sagan Center. And Natalie's gonna give us a quick overview of uh, the Carl Sagan Center, what they do there and how they operate. So Nat, let's turn it over to you. Yeah, um, thank you, Bill. Uh, something that I wanted to say though, is that technically, we know already that there is life beyond Earth because we have astronauts in the ISS, in the International Space Station. So technically, wow. and, and it's not life in a Petri dish, this is life in a can. But if we are looking for life that's different than us, this is a different question. And it's always interesting to see the conviction of people. And, so, and sometimes I think that our goal is to explain why or, or to show, you know, what is the reason why. There is a, a uh, an intuition that life is, a process that's common in the universe, but why and how we come up with those conclusions is something that is a, a lot of interest to, to people. So I, I have this uh, a great privilege to um, head the C uh, Center for Research at the Institute, and we really cover the entire spectrum of uh, astrobiology, which is that we are searching for life at all scale and everywhere, meaning that we're starting from the very beginning of life the origins of life up to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the techno signature. And, and so Andrew will talk more about that aspect of it. I, I, I will go around what we are doing in this other uh, part of the spectrum that look at the origins of life. And when we say the origins of life, we're starting from really the nuts and bolts, which is that how stars are being formed. Because if you want planet and you want habitable planet, you have to understand how those planets are forming and they are forming around stars. So we have astronomers and astrophysicists who are looking at how stars are forming in, in, in a planetary clouds, and then how organic material is being delivered to uh, planets that are being formed. And this is the role of our astrochemist at uh, the SETA Institute. Then once we have that, we need to understand whether a planetary environment is going to be habitable or not. And to do so, then we do have, we can use uh, terrestrial analogs and those extreme environment to sort of get a, a, a feeling for what those environments look like and what type of life is uh, possible on them. But also more importantly right now, this stage of exploration, how, what they are and how we can detect them and actually build the instrumentation to go and find them. So we are looking at this type of life, but we are also looking at the type of life that can exist beyond planet Earth, which is in exoplanet. And we have a group, a very important group at the Institute as well, in terms of what they are doing, but also in terms of the results that they have and the group that participated in the Kepler mission, K2, now working with the TESS mission, looking for exoplanet. So they are looking using mission uh, data to do that. We also have astronomers that who are looking from ground-based telescope to search for exoplanet. And um, I also have a, uh, a, a, a joke that I like, I like to make for the SETI Institute because this is not necessarily something that is known to everybody, which is to say that if it has flown in the solar system, it's flying in the solar system or will fly in the solar system, them, the SET Institute is involved. We have this incredible depth of experience of people who are uh, uh, participating and involved in planetary mission and in uh, uh, space mission as well. So the breadth of research at the Institute really covers the entire spectrum of astrobiology. And we are not only looking at exploring 
space and planets, but also using the tools and technologies that we are developing for exploring planet, which is really uh, the top of what can be done in technology. We're using this to go back and look at our own planet and try to help the monitoring uh, and the forecasting of the future of our own planet. Something that is really important to me as well is to think in terms of, you know, what does it mean to be searching for life? What is the impact on our society? What do people think? And this is what you've been doing with those two polls already, trying to understand what it means to be searching for life. So there is also a societal and philosophical aspect uh, to the Carl Sagan Center, uh, which is uh, uh, now getting started and has more activity than in the past. And finally, the most recent, um, um, the most recent addition to the Carl Sagan Center is a uh, place where we are looking at what is intelligence. And this question is really the bridge between astrobiology as it is done so far, the classical astrobiology looking at the origins of life to development of simple life and the bridge to the SETI search and the techno signature, what Andrew is doing. And we're trying to understand with a nascent gr group here, what is intelligence? How does it relate to the evolution of life and other questions as, such as intelligence and consciousness? So I'm really looking forward in the near future to have absolutely fascinating debates and panels and more discussion and more SETI talk where we can share those new advances at the SETI Institute. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you, Nat, for that overview. And um, it's a good segue into uh, the next topic. I'm just going to give you a little data point since you mentioned the Kepler mission, where actually the Institute had um, about 18 people on the Kepler mission, where we not only managed the data pipeline for NASA for that mission, but also wrote the algorithms that did the, the planet detection uh, in that program. So that was the mission from NASA that discovered uh, the ubiquity of exoplanets, the fact that planets are pretty much a, a statistically there are one or more planets around every single star. And so just to give you a little perspective on that, that suggests in our own galaxy alone, the Milky Way, that there are potentially, we, we, not, we know not only the ubiquity of planets, but we also know a, a roughly what percentage, around 20 odd percent plus or minus of those are Earth-like habitable zone worlds uh, that could potentially uh, support life. And the number of those planets uh, estimated in our own galaxy is in the tens of billions which makes our next speaker's um, mission uh, all the more interesting and intriguing. So Andrew, guide us through a little discussion and, and introduce SETI programs at the SETI Institute. Um, great, thank you very much, Bill. I'll just get my, uh, my slide up here. Um, well, it's a, a pleasure to be with uh, all of you. I see there's some 230 some uh, folks just on, just on Zoom and probably lots more on some of the, the streaming services. Uh, so it's, it's wonderful to see so much uh, interest in this topic. Um, my work at the Institute is, as uh, Bill and Natalie have already mentioned, focused around the direct search for uh, intelligent life. Uh, and we do that by looking for something called techno signatures. Uh, techno signatures are a remotely detectable indicator of technology. Uh, and if there's technology out there, then we presume that there must have been some intelligent life that produced it. For the last hundred years or so, our own civilization has produced uh, copious techno signatures. Uh, and one of the most detectable uh, forms of, of, of those techno signatures are radio signals uh, that leak off of this planet from television transmitters and radars and uh, other kinds of, of communication systems and leak out into interstellar space. And in the, the techno signature search or the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, we kind of turn that idea around uh, and we imagine that if there are other uh, intelligent civilizations out there, uh, and perhaps like us, they developed uh, some kind of electromagnetic technology, we could use very sensitive antennas or very sensitive telescopes on the surface of the Earth uh, or in space to try to detect those uh, other civilizations. Now, in the hundred years or so since we uh, invented radio, there have been lots of other kinds of uh, electromagnetic technology invented. We've invented lasers, and we now use uh, lasers to, to communicate uh, over fiber optic cables on the Earth, but also to communicate to space. Uh, there's ground to satellite 
uh, laser communication that's becoming more and more interesting as we uh, explore space more and more. And just like radio signals, those laser signals uh, can leak out into, uh, into interstellar space. And we can, uh, in a similar way that we use radio telescopes to detect distant radio signals, we can use optical telescopes uh, or other kinds of optical detectors to detect uh, very distant uh, laser signals. Um, as many of you probably know or, or can imagine um, by, by the name of the SETI Institute, um, the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence was in fact the founding activity uh, of the Institute. And there in the, the top left of your screen is a, a photograph of uh, one of the founders of the SETI Institute, uh, Dr. Jill Tarter, um, pictured there next to the Arecibo Observatory, uh, which was one of the early telescopes used by the SETI Institute uh, for the SETI search uh, called Project Phoenix, uh, which was the SETI program that came after um, NASA terminated funding uh, for SETI in the, in the early 90s. Um, and uh, until very recently was the, the most comprehensive SETI search uh, that had ever been, been done. Um, incidentally, uh, the Arecibo telescope is not just a, a part of the past uh, of the SETI Institute, it might also be uh, a part of the future. Uh, we're engaged in a number of very interesting discussions uh, with the Arecibo Observatory to explore ways uh, that we might be able to do new and very interesting uh, SETI programs uh, with, that, with that dish. And also, of course, many of you probably know that uh, the dish was, was recently damaged um, uh, when uh, one of the, the uh, tower cables uh, collapsed and we're all very much looking forward to Arecibo getting uh, back online 100% uh, in the very near future. Um, on the bottom of the, the screen, there are uh, a couple of the current SETI projects that we're working on uh, at the Institute. And I'll just sort of walk through those uh, in sequence to give you a, an idea of some of the ways that, that we're actually exploring this uh, idea in practice. Um, the first there on the left is the Very Large Array or the VLA. This is a, a radio telescope uh, located in Socorro, New Mexico. You might've seen this telescope in the movie Contact. Uh, this was in fact the, the telescope that was used by, uh, by Ellie Arroway to, to detect the first uh, extraterrestrial intelligence um, in that movie. Um, but I, although it was featured very heavily in that movie, uh, it, it's only been quite, quite recently that um, there's been an opportunity to actually do significant SETI work uh, with the, the telescope. Um, and just in February of this year, um, actually at the last physical meeting that, that I attended um, at the um, American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting, we announced a partnership with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory who operates uh, the VLA to bring uh, a major new SETI initiative um, to that telescope called COSMIC. Uh, it's very much uh, in the early, the early stages, but eventually that program will allow us to observe uh, with the VLA 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, in, a, in a commensal observing mode where we get a copy of the data that the telescope produces uh, and search it for particular signals of interest uh, for SETI or, or techno signatures. Um, there in the, the bottom middle of your screen is the Allen Telescope Array. This is just about four and a half or five hours north uh, of where most of us are here in the, in the Bay Area. This is a, a telescope that was uh, constructed in 2008. Um, it is entirely owned and operated by the SETI Institute, uh, both the telescope uh, as well as, as the observatory grounds uh, that it sits on. And this telescope was purpose built for the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It has all of the features uh, that, that we want uh, specifically for, uh, for SETI searches. And notably, it can search a huge range of the electromagnetic spectrum. With conventional radio telescopes, we have to kind of pick and choose where on the, the radio dial we want to observe uh, at any one time. Um, but the Allen Telescope Array actually can observe up to 12 gigahertz uh, of bandwidth uh, instantaneously from about a few hundred megahertz up to about uh, about 12 gigahertz, uh, which is a, about a factor of five larger uh, than, than any other radio telescope. So it's very, very fast. Uh, it's also very, very fast because it has small dishes. And the great thing about small dishes is you see a really big um, patch of the sky. Uh, and over the last couple of years, uh, the ATA has been undergoing a refurbishment program uh, that we're just about in the middle of uh, that are dramatically expanding its capabilities, its flexibility, um, and we're looking forward to uh, re-inaugurating it as a SETI search uh, instrument later this year. Uh, finally, on the bottom right there is a, a picture of a, a new program uh, that just has started out in the last couple of years at the Institute called Laser SETI. Uh, this is a, will eventually be an all sky, all the time search for very, very bright 
optical flashes. Uh, I already mentioned um, that, that laser communication systems are a uh, very, uh, very exciting thing going on in, um, in space communication research. Uh, there's also a number of projects thinking about how lasers might even be used to propel spacecraft uh, to very, very high velocities. Uh, and these kinds of signals would be very readily detectable uh, by something like, like laser SETI. So um, we like to say we're, we're searching the electromagnetic spectrum from DC to, to daylight. Uh, and um, this gives you a little bit of a flavor of, of how we're doing that at, at radio and, and optical wavelengths. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, that's a, a good overview. And as you can see, uh, there's a wide range of, of programs and, uh, and SETI by its nature is very much a collaborative science. So you know, not only do we have our own radio telescope array that we operate and, and as Andrew mentioned, uh, are, are in the process of enhancing, but also working in partnership with other observatories um, gives us access to incredible uh, technologies. And of course, the more eyes and ears on the sky on the more different places, um, you know, the, the, the optimal SETI observation strategy is one where you're always looking at all the sky all the time. So uh, the, more, the more radio telescopes we can deploy and other optical instruments we can deploy to look on the sky at all the time, the, the better our chances are. Um, so let's turn this over now to education programs and STEM programs at the Institute. And, you know, they've, they've said that um, if you want to make a blockbuster movie that everybody will love, you know, it, it should be about space and exploration and in space and astronauts or about dinosaurs. So I think if we make a space movie that combines the two, you know, dinosaurs, astronauts or something, it's, it's really bound to be successful. But everybody loves space and space exploration. We use it to our advantage and Pamela's going to tell us how. You need to unmute Pamela. There we go. Yeah, thank you, Bill, and my slide. Ah, there's my slide. Thank you, Simon. Okay, so the Center for Education has developed a really rich and renowned reputation over the last 30 years. We've had funding from NASA, NSF, Foundation for Microbiology, Moore Foundation, ArcJet Foundation. Uh, we also received funding from the Combined Federated Charities and from private donors. Um, so our research is multi-generational. And we need to inspire and engage the next generation of scientists and engineers. And I'm going to give a shout out to the engineers, my original tribe. Yeah, I'll, well, heart will always be there. Um, so in my slide on the left, I've illustrated our formal education efforts, grades K through 16, and the informal education efforts with a couple of icons. Um, under formal education, we've developed curriculum, we've delivered countless hours of teacher professional development and classroom visits, and we've also hosted summer undergrad interns with funds from a suite of sources. The Institute has also hosted graduate student interns, but those are funded by their respective science or research programs. They're outside of the Center for Education. Our current Airborne Astronomy Ambassador Teacher Development Program has had an impact on, on over 50,000 learners. And we have five more years of uh, working with teachers and their students to increase those numbers. One teacher can reach over 100 students a year for every year that they teach. Over the last 15 years, we've had 200 undergrad interns that have completed research in topics such as exoplanets, earthquakes, SETI, chemical engineering, microbiology, planetary protection, just to name a few of the topics. Our alums have gone on to be leaders in industry, science journalists, some of the top journalists in the nation, as well as becoming PhD researchers and professors and classroom teachers. Our informal education work has included planetary programs, museum exhibit development, workshop partnerships with science and museums um, across the country, and out of school programs. Our Reaching for the Stars NASA Science for Girl Scout program has developed space science badges that have been completed by over 100,000 Girl Scouts in just the first year and a half. Uh, we've trained thousands of council staff and troop volunteers via in-person and virtual workshops. It is 2020 after all. 
Uh, we're also the home of the EV Scope Citizen Science Network, which is in its infancy, and it bridges education and outreach. And we really look forward to the growth of that network and the, contribute to, uh, and the contributions of citizen science to science research. So how do you, we accomplish all of that with a small, app, small staff, I'm sure you're asking. So on the note, on the right, you'll note the partnership icon. We partner with the great societies and institutions in our area, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, Lawrence Hall of Science, Girl Scouts USA, our local council, Chabot Space and Science Center, Cal Academy, San Jose State University, Cal Poly, San Francisco State University. And I could just go on and on. Uh, with a list of our great partners that help us marry science, engineering, and education. Some of our individual scientists also work with 4-H, Boy Scouts of America, and local libraries. Further, we've worked with organizations that help us reach the underserved and underrepresented populations to really broaden our footprint. Uh, we worked with Society of Women Engineers, National Order of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers, and the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. And that's also just a short list of, the, of these societies that we're working with. So why do we do this? Contrary to Bill saying, we hope you don't have to ask why, but why do we do this? Well, our, uh, our next generation of scientists and engineers are children. We see scientists and engineers in our children every day. Children are curious, which is scientific, and they tinker with everything you put in front of them, which is engineering. So how does formal and informal education nurture the scientists and engineers of tomorrow that we need for our future? Well, at the bottom right, I've referenced the Next Generation Science Standards, which is a three-dimensional learning framework that guides our work. NGSS includes both science and engineering practices, core concepts, and cross-cutting concepts. So in other words, what scientists, engineers, and students do what scientists, engineers, and students know, and how those scientists, engineers, and students think. Uh, the framework also includes math and English Common Core standards in the performance expectations to encourage the round progressive development of students, an overall well-rounded student. These documents are descendants of inquiry-based learning, which some of you may be familiar with, and also the AAAS benchmarks for scientific literacy, which some of you are also probably familiar with. So through hundreds of teacher development events and hundreds of informal science events, we've reached over 500,000 learners, cradle to grave, all ages, and we're looking forward to reaching the next 500,000. Thank you. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Pamela. And, you know, I, I think you can see and hear, you know, the passion in, in Pamela's uh, expression of, of the work we do. And I have to say that while the Institute uh, is famous for our, our, our research and our science, you know, I'm equally proud of our education programs and the impact they have. You heard Pamela mention the numbers uh, of, of people that we're reaching and learners of all ages. And science literacy is such an important um, reality that we, we need to address or the lack of science literacy in this country and around the globe. So these kinds of programs that leverage the just the fascination and the curiosity that is inherent in all of us to our advantage by, as uh, Pamela mentions, bringing on the next generation of scientists and engineers and people who are going to solve the tough problems of today is, is so critically important. And we're very proud of that work. So we'll get a little in, more into that subsequently. And uh, to round it off for us, let's go to Simon to talk about education, but also outreach and communications and the role they play in the Institute. Simon? Yes, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world and welcome. And I'm just looking down the list of, of where people are signing in from. I can see Canada, the Netherlands, India, uh, Sedona in Arizona, Chile, uh, Montreal, Baltimore, um, India. So. I think um, that says a lot about the community of the SETI Institute. Uh, the fact that it is a global community uh, is truly a planetary community. And there's a, there's a fascination uh, that is borderless in the work that's going on at the Institute. Um, the fact that you're also here, uh, and I'm gonna share myself live, means that you already know a lot about the uh, Center for Outreach at the SETI Institute because you wouldn't have been joining us had you not 
had the experience of maybe going to our website of uh, going onto Facebook, uh, going onto YouTube and, and signing up for this talk. And I think um, the fact that this, this uh, SETI Talks Now is, is virtual instead of, uh, as Bill said, uh, an in-person event means that everybody in the world can share um, and talk about the amazing work that's going on. So let me pull up my slide here. And I just want to say that, um, as Pamela said, the, 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 the team um, behind the education, behind the outreach is not that large. And um, pretty much everyone involved in these uh, Center for Outreach is involved in this production as we speak. They're all behind the scenes. And I think the first thing I'd like to do is to uh, uh, introduce virtually uh, Rebecca McDonald, who you'll be seeing a little bit later, um, Lee, Jasmine uh, and Beth, who are the the behind the scenes gurus who who make these these uh, presentations possible. And um, there's a lot of preparation to go into these uh, SETI talks. Uh, there's the recruitment of scientists. There's the planning. There's testing the technology. We're all getting much better at that now than we were back in March. Uh, so it seems seamless, um, but sometimes there's a little bit of panic uh, in the background as well. Um, so beyond SETI talks, what's going on? I, I want to quote, um, uh, as one does, a physicist, Erwin Schrodinger here. Um, he said that if you can't ultimately tell everyone what you're doing, then your doing has been worthless. Now, I don't know if Schrodinger himself actually succeeded in that, because <laughs> having taken quantum mechanics, uh, he didn't succeed with me. But uh, there's an argument there that it's all very well scientists going off into the, the desert of the Atacama or going diving into uh, the ice fields of the Arctic and Antarctic. But unless you can convey uh, the science that you're looking for, the, 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 the quest that you're on and the excitement that you're bringing to that quest to everybody, then there's no real point in doing it. And I think one of the primary goals of the outreach, Center for Outreach is to uh, express this excitement, express the adventure and, and explain the science that's going on. So, so I think the first thing I'd like to say is that the, the, the primary role of, or one of the major roles of the Center for Outreach is to showcase the, the science and the education that is uh, being produced at the saint Chi Institute. There's so much going on, but it's important to express that and convey that science to, to you uh, to other scientists in as many different ways as possible. And if you look at the, the, the first two uh, on the left-hand side images, we've got a wonderful video of, of Dale Anderson diving below the ice uh, at the poles, um, bringing this sort of uh, imagery back to, to uh, us who cannot actually experience it in person is very, very important. And expressing that and communicating with the scientists in a way that, that is this comprehensible uh, and and accessible. And uh, the, the below left is, is me interviewing Apollo, um, who is a dog that is uh, uh, integral in the, the, the exploration or the potential exploration and colonization of Mars, um, seen with his uh, partner in crime, Pascal Lee. Uh, this is a still from a SETI Live, and a lot of you may have tuned into the SETI Live programs. Um, there is one tomorrow at 10 o'clock Pacific, and please do join us. And it's a chance to informally chat with the scientists and for you, uh, wherever you are in the world, to actually ask some questions. It's not just uh, the SETI Institute of Science itself, but it's science as a whole that we are interested in because science is such, an, such a, 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 a mesh of different disciplines and different uh, areas, different uh, scientists coming together to, to, to look for answers and, and solve the problems of the universe. Um, and so I think interpretation of science that is not necessarily SETI science is another important part of the Center for Outreach. The center above slide um, is a still, a publicity still from Big Picture Science, which is our uh, podcast and radio show that goes out every week uh, it showcases and discusses SETI science, SETI Institute science, of course, but it also talks about the, the bigger picture, hence its name, 
of the science that's important to, to us all. Uh, they did nine amazing shows on the subject of, of viruses, coronavirus, and allows us all to, to hear from experts, from people who actually are involved both uh, in the lab and in the hospital in this particular case, uh, and get a clear impression of what's actually going on. And that in, in the current climate is sometimes, sometimes difficult. I think interpretation as well is very important. We have at the SETI Institute uh, an artist in residence program. Uh, and this is uh, an image here of one of the artists in residence, uh, Zenab Al Hashemi, who has worked with one of our scientists, Mark Showalter, in developing an artistic interpretation of the science. Because people learn different ways, both visually, um, audially, and also uh, in, in terms of art and music, you can get across scientific concepts and, and scientific understanding. The last two slides, uh, one may be familiar to you, top right is, is uh, uh, from a gun camera of, a, of an F-18 fighter of a supposed either a UFO or a flying uh, peanut. Um, <laughs> the question is um, what is happening here? And I think that these um, uh, amazing stories, uh, maybe stories that are too amazing, uh, need to be addressed head on as well. And it's very important when you see news items like this, that you can go to a source of information that you can trust that's rational and will give you a scientific explanation. And uh, a very good article by, by Seth Shostak here, uh, uh, senior astronomer, looks at these in a critical way. And um, we would like it if the SETI Institute is the place that people go to if they are seeing something that is quite amazing and maybe a little bit too amazing. Uh, the slide below right, of course, is, is a, a graphic of life on Venus. Uh, this may be slightly um, more plausible than, than these uh, UFOs buzzing uh, F-18s over the Pacific, but you never know. Uh, and it's important to have a rational explanation and a rational discussion. And I think that's what the SETI Institute does and that's what the Center for Outreach does as well. It's a place we would like you to come to, um, to have a discussion about this, uh, all of these ideas, all of these amazing concepts um, and the search for life in the universe. Uh, it's, it's a journey that is so important to us all, uh, scientists, engineers, uh, whatever your profession, uh, wherever you are in the world. And um, the fact that you're here with us today means that uh, you're joining us on that journey. Great. Here. Thank you, Simon. Uh, that's wonderful. And, um, you know, there's a reason why the logo of the SETI Institute is a stylized question mark. Um, you know, we're commodity traders in curiosity, and you're all here because you have curiosity. We are all curious, and curiosity is really at the heart of, you know, all our advancements as a species and uh, uh, hopefully has still so much to teach us. Um, so let's get into some questions that I have, and then we'll We'll give the audience a, a crack at it as well. Um, in the interest of time, I will ask you to keep your answers somewhat concise because I have questions for each of you. But let's start with you, Nat. And, and one of the questions I have that I think people will be interested in is, you know, you've got this, your own background here, I know, is your a research location in the Atacama Desert in the Andes uh, in Chile. And um, so why do researchers at the Institute and people doing the kind of work we do go into these so-called analog sites? What is an analog site? What does it teach us? What does it mean? What do you do there? You have to unmute. <laughs> these sites are, are really important for a number of reasons. Uh, the first one is a very practical reasons. It's because well, you know, we have a number of windows to go to planets and to visit them. We cannot send them all the time. And then we have a limited amount of money uh, to do that too. So we need to make the most of it, but we still have knowledge gaps. And to prepare best the next mission, we are going to places that provide us with the, you know, the more analogy, the more similarities with those planetary environments that we want to explore. And in the case of the landscape that I have behind me, and I already answered a number of questions uh, online uh, about it, it's uh, indeed in the Altiplano in Chile. And the reason we go there, it's because it's very, very similar on an environmental scale uh, to what Mars was early on. And there we can learn 
in a place that has a lot of UV, uh, that is very arid, that doesn't have much water, that has a lot of uh, uh, radiation, a lot of salt. These are conditions that we're expecting on Mars very early on. What kind of life survives, where it does survive, how can we recognize it, and what kind of instrument can we develop to recognize, to recognize it and try to find it at the surface of Mars. So it's an analogy work. It's a way where we can rehearse and prepare missions. And it's valid for, you know, icy words as well. But in that case, we would go to Iceland or to the polar caps like uh, Dale does, for instance. Mm -hmm. So in these environments, you can, you know, not only, um, you know, uncover methodologies for you know how to look for life or how to study these environments, but also technology development, right? I, I mean things like rovers and instrumentation that end up going on these missions. They they can be you know tried and tested in, in these types of environments, or even the kinds of instruments that are needed can be uh, developed here. Absolutely. So you can test components. Uh, you can do the science on one hand, and you can test instruments or think about concepts of instruments. And when you have all of this. Then you put everything on a platform, and usually we put them on, on, on rovers, and then we rehearse uh, re uh, simulation of mission that it, it are in real condition of missions, which is that usually we are commanding the rover from the United States, and the rover is doing its own thing in, uh, in Chile, for instance, uh, as if it was on Mars. Yeah, very interesting. Excellent, thank you. And Andrew, um, before the uh, Kepler mission, I mean, the first exoplanets were really discovered in the late uh, 1990s, um, but we still didn't know whether this was a, a, a rare or common phenomenon, the existence of planets around other stars. And so with, with Kepler, we really learned that, you know, my goodness, planets are, are everywhere and that uh, statistically all the stars have at least one, if not more. You know, what, what has that meant to SETI as an endeavor, uh, from your perspective, how important has that discovery been? And, 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 uh, and to what extent has it, or is it shaping the kind of SETI research and the kind of uh, techno-signature programs that are being contemplated and developed? Um, well, this is a, a great question. I, I think it, you know, in summary, it's impossible to overstate how important this uh, discovery was. And, as you said, you know, we heard a lot about uh, during the Kepler mission and, 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 and now with the test mission, seems like every couple of days we hear about a new exoplanet that's discovered and how similar it is uh, to the Earth. And obviously each of those individual discoveries are very exciting, but the most important thing is the statistical uh, discovery, as you said, that, that all stars uh, have, have planetary systems. Uh, you know, I, I've said before, and I, I think that this is absolutely true, that um, the, that discovery from the Kepler mission is the, the greatest step forward in the Copernican revolution since, since Nicholas Copernicus. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think as a, as a kind of philosophical um, uh, kind of motivator, that, that sort of understanding, that sort of innate understanding that um, uh, planetary systems are as common as they are, uh, is um, probably the singular largest motivating factor not just in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, but the search for life broadly. There's just a tremendous amount of real estate out there. Now, from a practical standpoint, uh, you know, one of the questions that we're often asked is, you know, are you pointing at this planet? Or are you pointing at that planet when there's another discovery of another exoplanet? And in some cases, um, the, the answer to that is yes. Um, the TRAPPIST-1 system, for example, is a very, very interesting system in and of itself. And we spend, you know, a lot of time observing that system and, and certain other, other systems. But um, really what uh, the Kepler mission tells us is that uh, if we want to look for um, life on Earth-like planets, we just have to point at stars. We don't have to point at specific stars. We just have to point at, point at stars. Um, so it uh, definitely uh, makes things like um, survey observations, galactic plane survey observations, much more uh, well-motivated. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it, it is amazing. And I will say, you know, there's this certain element of job security that I guess has come from this exoplanet discovery that means for like you and Matt and all the scientists we have, it's like, yeah, there's a lot to explore out there. And uh, uh, at least where planets are concerned, we're definitely not alone. So there's so much to be gained by, by the work from both the SETI perspective and astrobiology perspective. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, Pamela, question for you, shifting gears back to the education side. I know that, you know, I, I gave you and Simon the 
the, the rather daunting but, but fairly straightforward task of solving science literacy um, on, on our planet um, as, a, as an aspirational goal. What do you see as kind of the future of education programs at the Institute? How do you see education programs at the Institute evolving uh, in, in, in the coming years? Oh, uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to leverage the things that we're best at and, uh, and you know, springboard and move forward. And we certainly know that we have expertise in teacher professional development, which, let, you know, one teacher is over 100 students a year. And we've also really gained experience and footing in the out-of-school environment with, with our, you know, uh, Girl Scout work. And, and we know our PIs work with 4-H and Boy Scouts and other organizations. And astrobiology, space science, as we know, you know, interests everybody. And when we developed the Voyages Through Time curriculum, which was an astrobiology curriculum, we found that it, in, as a survey science for ninth or 10th grade, we found that it did engage more students than a traditional course because it was the context. You know, how did I get here? You know, if all of these events didn't happen, I don't exist. So, it, you know, it's the we are startup stuff. And if you engage students as stakeholders of their own knowledge, you know, they're, they're more interested. So I would like to continue teacher professional development um, in using astrobiology as a context and also use that astrobiology context for out of school learning for youth and really have a STEM program. So I'm looking at you, Bill, saying we need space and we need a lab so that we can bring middle school students and give them true STEM projects where they're working with technology and they have to use math to solve a problem and their writing skills to write up their reports. Well, this is one of the reasons why we're looking very much forward to that post COVID world when we can actually get back together again and do things like bring students together in our environments and, and so forth. Um, Simon, I got one question for you, then let's turn it over to the audience because I could ask you guys questions all day, but that really wouldn't be fair. Um, just uh, speak for a moment, if you would, on you know, the power of, of collaborations and, uh, and partnerships for doing the kind of work we do, including you know, in, in the outreach area. I know that you're, you've been working on many uh, really inspiring and, and amazing uh, collaboration projects. Yeah, I think um, there's two reasons to collaborate. One is the the the, the uh, limited resources of, of an institution, unless you're Harvard or NASA, you need to to, to reach out uh, to other groups who have expertise or, or resources that you don't necessarily have, and you complement each other very well. And I think um, what's interesting is that during this lockdown it's allowed us almost to, to, to reach out much more easily, um, ironically, to, to other organizations who are also sort of feeling their way to try and uh, think of new ways to reach their, their audience. Um, a good example, uh, as you say, we have lots and some of them are international. Uh, and uh, obviously people can go to the website and read more about these, but, but our um, uh, arrangement with uh, Chabot Space and Science Center, who's the other side of the bay, um, that's always been there as a, a sort of low level and we've been talking to them a lot, but they have a, an audience and they have some, some facilities and some um, uh, resources that we lack and vice versa. We have uh, the scientists uh, that we can bring into a discussion. They have an incredibly close relationship with the Oakland school system and, and the communities in, in uh, the East Bay. And that synthesis of the, 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 what we have to offer and what they have to offer is leading to some very, very interesting conversations. Uh, we have monthly um, joint talks um, that have gone very, very well and are reaching new audiences for us and also new audiences uh, for them. And so I think um, these will become global. We've just started an interesting collaboration with a German university to look at uh, how to, um, how to market the SETI Institute and how to maybe think about uh, how we get girls into science in different cultures around the globe. And these are all incredibly powerful collaborations that, that are, are being put in place. And uh, that's very, very exciting. It really will become a sort of a global uh, network very, very soon, I think. So you, you, you took on the challenge and you said, yes, we will, we will go global with our science literacy and 
<laughs> I think the problem is we, 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 we're stuck with one planet and it's time to expand. Yes, exactly, exactly. Great, well, thank you. Well, uh, so why don't we do the following? Let's have Rebecca pop up here uh, so that she can pull some, some questions. I'm sure there's been more than a few and, uh, and ask those. And maybe Rebecca, I guess if we can do this in parallel while you're asking the first couple of questions, Lee could pop up the, uh, the poll questions again and let our audience uh, uh, share their thoughts and see what kind of change. I mean, we had such a pretty overwhelming majority on our side of the fence before, but nevertheless, let's pop those up again. And then Rebecca, let's uh, see what kind of questions you've got for our, our panelists. You'll have to Sorry, the, po the poll question popped up in front of my face. <laughs> Anyhow, hi, everybody. Yeah, there are a lot of questions, and I'm going to apologize in advance that we can't get to all of them, but I will do my best. Um, and I think the first question uh, maybe goes to Andrew, um, and it's, what is the playbook of if a signal is found? Will it be kept a secret? Will we hold a press conference? What will happen? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, absolutely not keep it a secret. Uh, you know, as, as astronomers, um, our, our most important job, if we, if we find anything that we think is interesting, is to follow up on it as quickly as possible uh, with as many observational resources as, as possible. So we maintain very close collaborations with observatories all over the world that um, allow us to, um, to, to follow up on a, a signal across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, uh, constantly, uh, if if need be, um, kind of further uh, afield from the the actual detection in terms of um, you know re releasing information more more widely and how um, uh, these kinds of things would be handled. There's actually a a set of protocols developed by the International uh, Academy of Astronautics uh, SETI Permanent Committee, um, which um, myself and and many other folks at the institute were kind of integrally involved in in developing. Um, and that um, it basically lays out a, a sequence of, of steps that would be followed um, if such a detection uh, were made. Um, but really the most important underlying philosophy of that document uh, is to inform the world and, and to not, not keep it a secret. So, so openness and, and transparency um, are, are really the most important um, aspects of that, that protocol. You know, it's, um, it's a great question and we get that question a lot. And you know, um, certainly if we were to get some kind of an interesting signal and verify and validate as Andrew talked about, that would certainly be pretty newsworthy. And yes, we'd hold a, a press conference. And you know, I, I kind of feel that I have a certain responsibility because I think as the CEO of the SETI Institute, if I call a press conference, everybody's gonna show up, no matter what else, or what other nonsense is happening in the world, everybody's gonna show up to that, that particular press conference because they're really gonna wanna know. So I, I, I'd better make sure that I I play that card carefully and, and don't overuse it. But uh, it, it's a great question. And uh, yes, we will absolutely uh, share this, such a, an important discovery with the world. Okay, Rebecca. Yeah, Bill, don't be the person who cried wolf for sure. Right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> the next question I think uh, goes to Pamela, but maybe some of the others of you can chime in um, because um, it, it could be more far reaching. And the question is from Sam and he asks, what does it take to become an astronomer? Uh, and I think we can talk about that, but all of you had different paths into the work that we do and you might wanna uh, add to the conversation. Um, well, I'll just start with, you're gonna have to you know, study math and science and English and um, computer coding you know, in high school and the, the, most of the scientists that I work with, most of the astrophysicists um, and the engineers have PhDs. And uh, that's just the, the blatant uh, standard uh, of excellence that it requires to reach the top of the field. There's, there, are, um, there are scientists and engineers on their teams. You know, to be a PI, you're gonna, it's, you're gonna have to be, have a PhD, but there are members of their teams that have bachelors that are doing graduate work um, so there's a myriad. So it depends if you want to be at the apex and be the PI and be the person writing, being the first author on papers and um, being responsible for grants and cooperative agreements. And then I'll turn it over to the, the, I may play a scientist on TV, but I'll turn it over to the real astrophysicists for their answers. <laughs> 
Well, you know, Pamela, I'd say that in general, scientists, you know, in the search for life, and, and they don't have one, one of the things too, is that you do not necessarily have to be an astronomer. You can, you know, you want to be an astronomer, you be an, an, an astronomer, but if you want to search for life in the universe, there is a range of things that you can do, but they all have one thing in common. If you want, as you said, to be the PI, the principal investigator on that, is that, well, science is good, it's actually, you, you have to know your science, whatever it is, whether it's astronomy or geology or whatnot. But what is important that people often forget is that you have to be good in English too. And, you know, take care of your grammar and all things. Believe me, I'm coming from France. I learned the hard way uh, because I had to learn a different language. But you will have to make a living by writing grants, which means competing against each other. And then you have to be the best. And there is no way around it. You have to convey your message. You have to be capable of articulating uh, your ideas. And so although we always talk about math, I, I, I really want to remind everybody that English is also very important. You know, when I go to uh, undergraduate schools or, or high schools or things like that and talk to the, the students or the faculty, I mean, that's the same message that I get. You know, don't underestimate the importance of learning how to write and speak and present your ideas. You you could have, you know, perhaps the the the, the most brilliant discovery uh, or invention of, of all time. Uh, but if you can't convey it, if you can't articulate it, it's it's not going to to do you much good. So that's such an important point. Any other uh, thoughts on that before we go to another question? Um, I think you're an I astronomer. How did you become an astronomer? <laughs> I think dedication, it's, it's a long slog um, that is probably not going to result in you buying a very, very nice mansion with a large pool. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a labor of love. And this is just as an astronomy. I think this is, this is any science. Um, it takes a, lo a lot of effort. And I think that the, the dedication and, and, and single-mindedness is, is quite an important trait as well to actually push through and spend a lot of time, you know, uh, when other people who you went to school with are out earning large salaries, you are going to university. Um, and, but, you know, it's worth it in the end. Um, so I think dedication, uh, hard work um, uh, and imagination and, and drive are very, very important as well. Well, you know, it's you, you bring up a good point. I mean, the, the, you know, this isn't a business that we're in because we came here to get rich, but uh, we, we did come here to get rich in, in other ways. And, you know, I've asked many of our scientists this question about, you know, what's, what gets them up in the morning and what, what is, you know, gives them the drive, as you said, Simon, to do what they do. And, um, you know, so many have said, you know, it's about that eureka moment. It's about that discovery, about that that insight, that, that understanding that, you know, it has been achieved for the first time, that opportunity to do something new and find something new. Um, and, and, and I think that's so true. You know, I think that, that our equivalent of, of a stock option is, you know, the cover of nature or science magazine or the, you know, the publication in, in a peer reviewed science journal. So, so there are other forms of gratification for our scientists, but you know, the, the passion that they bring uh, to their work is is something you know remarkable and extraordinary and and I would say admirable as well. Oh, yeah. In fact, there is no getting up in the morning because we don't go to bed. Period. <laughs> There's also that. <laughs> that is true, especially astronomers. <laughs> you know, you go to observatory and, and you tour around an observatory, and you know you'll you'll go past where where some of the the dormitory housing is, and there'll be signs that say you know quiet. Astronomers are sleeping because they sleep in the day and they're awake at night. Anyway, uh, what else have we got, Rebecca? I think this next question is actually for Natalie. There was an announcement recently about Venus and the discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere around Venus. Uh, so Richard asks, what's the next step to figuring out whether or not there is life on or around Venus? That's an excellent question. So there, there has been a lot of noise around uh, this uh, announcement. Announcement and and you know people should know that in the original paper uh, the scientists have presented uh, two three hypotheses life being one of them but certainly not the only one and and obviously this one is the most exciting uh, but uh, there are a number of reasons why we might think that it's also the less probable uh, because of the environment of Venus but just to settle things and and to have the answer I think that the best 
uh, response to that is to have a mission, go explore that atmosphere of Venus and do some in situ um, analysis of those gases. And so what is really important now is that when you are uh, thinking about the concept of a mission, you need to think about scientific objectives and the kinds of things that you want to do. Well, Venus did that for us. Now we know that the kind of thing that we are looking for and the kind of hypotheses that we want to test. So that gives us an idea about the type of instrument payload that we want to put on, on this uh, spacecraft. So in my views, I think that um, a mission to Venus in, in, you know, sooner rather than later would be a very good idea. We've got some ideas on that front, Natalie, right? <laughs> um, okay, let's, uh, I think we have time for one more question. We will probably have to wrap it up because uh, we're, we're past the top of the hour, but um, if people have enjoyed this and let us know, maybe we'll, you know, we'll have another opportunity in the near future to dig a little deeper into the Institute. So uh, what's a good final question for us today? I, I think this last question goes to Simon and it's, uh, uh, does the SETI Institute have any opportunities for citizen scientists? Great question. Yeah, and this is something um, Pamela can, can talk to as well. We, uh, I think we have um, quite an exciting collaboration, going back to a question Bill asked me about collaborations with, with a company called Unistella. Um, and one of our uh, staff members, uh, one of our scientists, uh, Frank Malchis, is involved in the development of, of this telescope um, that uh, some of you may have seen uh, or, or heard about in other um, of our SETI live talks. And it gives people a chance to participate in observations that will then be pooled um, and analyzed by uh, professional astronomers. Uh, for instance, looking at uh, the occultation of stars by asteroids to measure the size and dimensions of asteroids um, and uh, looking also for, for exoplanets. Uh, that is a wonderful opportunity to, to get involved um, and something that, that the SETI Institute is, is very excited to have that collaboration uh, uh, going. Uh, Pamela, do you want to add some? Yeah, just say there is, you know, there is a big step to participating in that, and that is uh, it, you have to be an EV scope owner uh, because most small diameter ground based telescopes that amateur astronomers, you know, have do not have the uh, capability of detecting extrasolar planets. Uh, it has a microprocessor built in, so it's doing some really fantastic observing in your backyard and, and uh, it, it's amazing. But for those who do have an EV scope or anyone who's really interested in collecting data that will contribute to science papers, um, you know, go, you can go to our website and, you know, in the search, look for EV scope, um, just like it sounds, EV scope. And, and, um, and once you have one, then you get a notice every month. This is where, what we're looking for. This is where we need data. And uh, we now have uh, just recently hired a part-time person to help write the manuals and do the training for uh, citizen science who want to participate in this network. You know, we also have uh, a newly announced, it was announced in a press release just a few months back. Um, we've merged uh, or you know, come together with the, the GNU radio, software defined radio organization. And there've been some you know, sort of hackathons and, and citizen science uh, gatherings there. Maybe, Andrew, you want to say a couple of words about GNU Radio and that uh, that area of activity? Yeah, just very quickly. Um, GNU Radio is a platform for uh, developing what's called software-defined radio, uh, which is sort of building radio instruments and software with a, a, a little bit of inexpensive hardware attached to your computer. And um, I, I think maybe it suffices to say at this point that there are some really phenomenal opportunities to uh, involve citizen scientists in um, both kind of developing um, software and techniques uh, for some of our observatories and also maybe even doing some some observations at home. So stay tuned. Great. I'd also like to add that at tomorrow at 10 o'clock Pacific, uh, we have a SETI live um, talking about um, a project called Planet Patrol, which is um, a citizen scientist opportunity to, to look for uh, exoplanets. So so tune back in uh, 10 o'clock Pacific tomorrow morning.
And that's on our, our Facebook platform. Is that that's right? on our Facebook platform, is correct. So these SETI live events uh, are, we're doing something every week and there's always something new and exciting going on. That's another example of, of the outreach programs at the Institute. So by all means, check that out and, and uh, you know, follow us on, on our social media platforms, which are, you know, we're on all of them, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, et cetera. And you can keep up to date with, with what we're doing. You can also um, visit our website at SETI.org and you can sign up for our uh, electronic monthly newsletter called Journey. And that uh, always has new and, and exciting articles and stories about our science and work we do uh, with different partners and collaborators and education programs. So it's another great way to keep up with all the work that's going on here uh, at the Institute. So I hope you'll do that. So I want, in closing, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, a, another question that comes up from time to time, which is, you know, why should uh, we spend time and energy and, and monies doing the kind of work that we do here at the Institute and why, why explore? And I guess my answer to that, I, I think, you know, I'm probably among the converted in our audience here today, but nevertheless, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, research and exploration explore and exercise that most human of traits, which is our curiosity. And without curiosity, there's no discovery, there's no insight, there's no understanding. Without curiosity, there's no knowledge, there's no invention, there's no innovation. And exploration stretches the limits of technology and that benefits everyone. And actually our work also informs research in a lot of other areas, including climate change and climate science, asteroid defense, communications and signal processing, cancer research, material science, sensor and instrumentation technology development. So, you know, our, our work at, at a very fundamental le level of, uh, of research and science informs all these other important areas. So basically without curiosity, from our perspective, there's simply no advancement of the human species. And so that's an answer to why we do what we do. And um, uh, maybe Lee, before we uh, close it down completely, you can pop up the um, responses we got to the, the second poll, see if we move the needle at all um, on that. So if you're able to share. So it looks like we're at 95%. So actually we, we lost a percentage point. So we was in one more percent think they're, they're not sure now. So we're gonna have to revisit what went wrong on today's <laughs> session, ladies and gentlemen, and, and see what happened. But we, we lost somebody there, but still 95% of you are quite certain that there's life beyond earth. And how about intelligent life? So 86%, did we lose one point there as well? Were we at 87, do I recall at the beginning? Um, in any case, uh, certainly overwhelming support for the idea that there's intelligent life beyond earth. Um, certainly a percentage that are not sure. I'll, of course, we saw some comments of wondering whether there's intelligent life on our planet. That's, that's for a different session we might get into later. But uh, in any case, just as a reminder, you know, the SETI Talks is a program of outreach at the SETI Institute and it is made possible by no donations from the public. It, we don't have any grant funding uh, or, or um, you know, public support for this. So it's really up to people like you who make it all possible uh, for us to put this kind of programming uh, together. So you know, please keep that in mind if you're visiting the SETI Institute website and you wanna help us out and support this kind of programming, we of course are very grateful. And with that, I'd like to thank our panelists and my colleagues for sharing your time and your thoughts with our audience today. I'd like to thank all of you for coming and joining us from all over our planet and hopefully uh, learning a little bit more about the SETI Institute and what we do and what we're all about. And we will have another SETI talk coming up. Is it the 22nd of October, Rebecca? Or the 26th? I... Yeah, it's the 22nd, 22nd. Uh, and it will be in the morning. Yeah, that's right. It's going to be at 10 o'clock Pacific time uh, in the morning and it's going to be about radio astronomy. So we'll dig a little deeper into that important area. Uh, so, you know, you got a little bit of that from Andrew today and we'll be talking all about that at the talk on the 22nd. So we hope you'll come back and join us then. And again, in the meantime, we thank you all for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you on another SETI talk next time. Thanks very much, everybody. Be safe and stay well.